water and time. That's the reason. You give water enough time to do pretty much anything and you'll end up with some of the most spectacular natural features on Earth. On the Colorado Plateau in the southwestern United States, this is especially true. Here, you'll find an incredible landscape carved, gouged, and sliced by the persistent, relentless power of water. This includes the hoodoos of Bryce Canyon, but not in the way you might think. Take the Grand Canyon, for instance. Over the course of millions of years, the Colorado River has dug itself deeper and deeper into the canyon, carving it into the massive expanse of eroded rock we see today. This is what rivers do, especially on the Colorado Plateau. But Bryce Canyon is different. It's different in that the hoodoos we see today, the feature the park is world-renowned for, were not formed by a river. At least, not in the way the Grand Canyon was formed by a river. It's a little bit complicated, but I think we can figure it out. Let's get into it. Alright, hoodoos. Now, you can find hoodoos on literally every continent on Earth, even Antarctica, apparently. And yes, I know they're made of ice and probably don't fit the specific definition of hoodoos, but generally speaking, hoodoos are simply tall, spindly spires of rock formed via erosion. They typically have a cap rock, which is less resistant to erosion, and a body that is susceptible to erosion. And the erosion will basically carve out these spires, these nice tall pillars of rock that we know as hoodoos. Again, this happens all over the world. They come in all different shapes and sizes. But nowhere in the world has a higher concentration of hoodoos than Bryce Canyon National Park in southern Utah. This place is famous for its hoodoos. They're pretty much the reason the park was even protected in the first place. And at first, people came and saw the hoodoos and were like, those are really pretty. But then they started wondering how they formed and asking questions. and so. People much smarter than I am had to figure these things out. I'm very thankful to those people because without them, this channel would not exist. What they discovered about Bryce Canyon though, about why it's so good for hoodoo development, is really fascinating. And believe it or not, it starts with a lake. Around 50 million years ago, this part of what is today Utah was underwater. It was covered by a large freshwater lake and into this lake poured the deposits of several streams from higher elevation areas around it. Silt, sand, debris, it all flowed into this lake. Over time, and again, we're talking millions of years here, over time, these deposits settled at the bottom of the lake and solidified into rocks, all kinds of rocks. You got your limestones, your siltstones, your dolostones, your mudstones, and your sandstones here at Bryce. That's, that's about it. Now, this lake and these rocks at this time were at or around sea level, and Bryce Canyon today sits anywhere between 7,600 and 9,100 feet, that's 2,300 to 2,700 meters, above sea level. So, these rocks, which would eventually become the hoodoos of Bryce Canyon, had to be uplifted somehow, nearly two miles into the sky. This is important for two reasons. One we'll get to later. The first reason this is important is because, well, the Colorado Plateau is just that, a plateau. When it was uplifted, it didn't buckle and bend and crinkle like mountains do, like this is how the Rockies were formed. No, the Colorado Plateau kind of just went straight up, like if you took a table and lifted it straight into the air. What this meant was that you now had a relatively high elevation, but flat surface. So when you introduce water into this equation, we know it wants to go down because gravity tells it to. So when the primordial Colorado River starts flowing out of the Rocky Mountains and it hits this plateau and finds a bunch of soft, erodible rock, it starts cutting and carving down, 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 all the way to the ocean. And its tributaries are doing the same thing, carving their own canyons while flowing into the Colorado. 
and those tributaries have tributaries carving their own canyons. You can start to see why the landscape of the Colorado Plateau looks the way it does. Streams and rivers carving canyons, eroding rocks, carrying all that material to the ocean. Now, here is where we arrive at our first protagonist in the story of Bryce Canyon. One of these Colorado River tributaries, the Pariah River, gets to work eroding another plateau. Well, it's more like a sub-plateau or a smaller plateau within the bigger Colorado Plateau. It doesn't matter. It gets to work eroding another plateau called the Ponsagunt? Ponsagunt? Pons? Ponsagunt. We're going with Ponsagunt. The Ponsagunt Plateau is important because it is on this plateau's eastern face that the famous hoodoos of Bryce Canyon can be found. So let's take stock of the scene here. You've got the Colorado River. It's flowing down from the Rockies across the Colorado Plateau, carving canyons as it goes. Now you've got the Pariah, which is flowing into the Colorado, and it's carving its own canyons. And the Pariah itself has tributaries carving their own canyons. These are the canyons of Bryce Canyon. And yes, there are multiple of them. Bryce Canyon National Park isn't just a single canyon. But these tributaries of the Pariah are ephemeral, which means they're not constantly flowing. Like they don't have water in them all the time. They really only flow when Bryce gets a lot of rain or snow melt. Now, another important point here, real quick. These canyons formed via the tributaries of the Pariah River, where we find the Hoodoos, are again, part of the eastern cliff face of the Ponsagant Plateau. These are known as the Pink Cliffs. That means these tributaries are very steep. So when they do flow with water, they cut down and they cut down hard and they carry a lot of material with them, leaving behind even deeper canyons. All right. Let's pull this all together and finally answer the question of how the Bryce Canyon hoodoos formed. Imagine this system we've been talking about, this massive system of interconnected and overlapping canyons and plateaus and mesas and streams and rivers. Erosional features are all over the place, all across the Colorado Plateau. This is what we're dealing with here. In one specific part of this system, on the eastern edge of the Ponsagut Plateau, this system has left us with large expanses of exposed rock faces. After the downcutting of the Pariah tributaries, there are now huge areas of rock face left open to other forms of weathering and erosion. These are what have given us the hoodoos of Bryce Canyon. By far the biggest one is what's known as ice wedging. Ice wedging is where water or snow melt seeps into vertical cracks in the rock, and when the temperatures drop, that water freezes in those cracks. When it freezes, it expands, and when it expands, the pressure of that expansion cracks the rock and breaks it apart. When the water melts, it carries that rock away, more water gets into the now enlarged crack, freezes again, expands again, cracks the rock again, melts again, carries the rock away again. In this way, over millions of years, hoodoos form along the vertical cracks in these rocks. The different shapes and sizes of the hoodoos all depends on the specific type of rock, chemical composition, things like that, but the basic process is the same. Now, remember when I said there were two reasons the uplifting of the rocks at Bryce Canyon was important? The first being the uplifting of the Colorado Plateau, and the resultant carving of that plateau by various rivers and streams. The second reason this uplift was important was that it put Bryce Canyon at an elevation nearly two miles above sea level. At this elevation, the temperature changes on a daily basis at Bryce Canyon are drastic. For nearly 200 days each year, temperatures both fall below and rise above freezing on the same day. If you'll recall, ice wedging occurs when water gets into cracks in the rock, freezes, cracks the rock, melts, and carries the rock away. So, because Bryce Canyon has such drastic temperature swings on a daily basis, there are a lot of opportunities for ice wedging to occur. This is why Bryce Canyon has a higher concentration of hoodoos than anywhere else in the world. The conditions are perfect for ice wedging, the main driver of hoodoo formation in Bryce Canyon National Park. Now, there are some other erosional forces at play here. 
rainfall mixing with carbon dioxide creates carbonic acid that lands on the rocks and eats away at them. There's probably a little bit of wind erosion going on, but the main driver of hoodoo formation at Bryce is that ice wedging. And you might be sitting there wondering why I just put you through the ringer of millions of years of geologic history and the complexities of Colorado Plateau geology, only to tell you that ice freezing and melting is the reason for all of Bryce Canyon's hoodoos. That would be a valid concern. I probably could have talked about the ice wedging in like two minutes probably, but that wouldn't have been the full story of how Bryce Canyon's hoodoos formed. Ice wedging is the modern day snapshot of hoodoo formation, but the millions of years before that tell the full story. From the freshwater lake to the uplift of the Colorado Plateau to the downcutting of all those canyons, each of these events acting slowly and methodically over millions of years helped to explain how Bryce Canyon's hoodoos got the way they did. These are what put the conditions in place for such prolific hoodoo formation. I think that story is worth telling too. Okay, that is everything I know about hoodoos. Sorry for the delay on this one. I have two scripts literally ready to go, ready to be made, but had some unexpected travel cancellations and I couldn't produce them in time. So those are on the back burner for now. If you're new here and want to hear about more park stories, consider subscribing to the channel. I talk about all things parks, from geology like this one to ecology, biology to cultural history. If it's in a protected place, I'll talk about it. So if that's your thing, yeah, check it out. I also have a Patreon where you can get like three extra videos a month, plus the video you're watching right now early and ad free. And I have a Discord. So hop on over to patreon.com slash nationalparkdiaries if you are interested in that. I'll see you there. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.